All right. My name is Rachel Woody, and I'm here with Bob McRitchie, mm -hmm. and we're here in his home on March 3rd. And my first question for you, Bob, is why wine? Life is a series of accidents. If you really want to know the story how I got in the wine, you'll have to wait. You'll have to, do you have the time? Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, I got a BA from Ohio Westland some years ago, and couldn't find a job, so I went off and joined the Navy and uh, tra traveled all over the place. When I got out of the Navy, I, could, I, I, I went back to school, ended up with a master's, uh, if I can just remember, Vanderbilt, and, uh, and a PhD. Uh, and with a PhD, I thought, you know, the world is my oyster, but I couldn't find an academic position. So I ran into a fellow named Paul Kalabi, who's not, not uh, was a family friend. Couldn't find the, I, I went, we went back to California, my wife's uh, home, weather was warm, and uh, I, I did find at the recommendation of a, of a, good, a good friend, I found a lab job uh, in, a, in a winery. So I started out my initial exposure to the American wine industry, other than as a consumer, was at Franciscan Vineyards in, in uh, the Valley of Napa. Uh, uh, so I got, got a job in the lab and then stumbled around and, uh, you know, you don't always have a whole lot of control over your life. And Franciscan sold uh, to some people that I, I don't care to talk about. But the one job that I had <laughs> after coming out of the Navy and getting married and trying to, trying to feed, feed the two of us was gone. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, about that time, there's a guy named Bill Blosser who was stumbling around the Napa Valley trying to find somebody to uh, serve as a, as a winemaker. And this, the same guy that recommended that I go to Franciscan recommended to Bill that, I, that he talk to me. Well, obviously, I'm, I'm not obviously not an academically trained winemaker, but I had quite a bit of experience in uh, the process itself. So Bill Blosser uh, hired me, but since I'd had construction experience along the way, um, I oversaw the construction of Sokol Blosser Winery, uh, which was a big job. I served, served basically as a liaison between the winery and vineyard and the uh, the contractor and uh, there were some some plans I guess you know, to turn this uh, into a functional production plant but they so I ended up with the Blossers financing the construction and I was, I served basically as the primary contractor in the construction of the building. That's another way to find a job too, is to build, build a winery around yourself, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and the Blosser, the Blosser family and uh, with small children and later on uh, their, their offspring uh, basically owned the project and I supervised the construction of the physical plant. Uh, it was nice to have next door uh, uh, a guy named Lett, who uh, really, really gave me a lot of moral support. You know, his vineyard was right next to, to Blossers, and uh, Dave, Dave Lett was certainly the old, the old man of the, of the industry in this, in this area besides being a, de a very decent human being. So I helped him out a little bit along the way too. I mean, he, he, uh, he had virtually no mechanical skills mm -hmm. and 
so I, when he bought a new press, I showed him which end to, 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 to put the grapes in and that sort of thing. But, uh, I'm sorry he's gone. He was, he was a really good, good uh, companion in that business. So that's basically how I got into the business. A series, Stomach, of, a series of accidents. And uh, I don't know how long was I with Sokol Blosser, a number of years. And uh, then I took a position where, did I, did I go from Blosser to, to the community college too, I think, where I, and I, in, uh, that was back in North Carolina. And I mm -hmm. built their, their, uh, their program too, or maybe I mentioned that already. The time, the time frame is a little confusing even to me. So anyhow, uh, I stumbled along in this business for a number of years, and it has it supported us rather well. Not rather well, but it supported us, let's put it that way. Uh, we have certainly watched the Oregon industry develop. We've seen a lot of crazy people come into this business that couldn't find, you know what, with their butt with both hands. Right. Uh, and uh, you may have run into a few of those, I don't know. Uh, the whole business of this uh, romance of the grape is fiction. You know, it's hard work, it's dirty, it's wet, it's cold, mm -hmm. and it demands a, gr a, a It's a polyfunctional job, too. You know, you really have to get your feet dirty, mm -hmm. literally, in the vineyard. You have to talk to the grapes, sing them little songs and whatever. You have to realize what, what the habitat itself can give you in terms of grape growing and uh, generally speaking I think Oregon has done a pretty good job in that department in, in planting cool climate varieties that work here rather well. We have problems right now and a lot of them have to do with ownership of huge lots of land by uh, California owners mm -hmm. and uh, their, uh, their view of what this is all about is somewhat different and uh, I think it's a. I think we're in a, a risky position in this industry right now because of, uh, of uh, absentee landlords. I guess I'd put it that way. Right. Some of them have bought land simply to have the land, uh, and uh, it may or may not be cultivated. It may or may not be used to make high quality grapes. We, this particular climate doesn't lend itself in this particular in this area uh, to high yield production. Mm -hmm. yeah, and if, if you've talked to other growers, and I'm sure you probably have or will if you haven't, you, you, you know the crop thinning is an important, very important part of the job is to keep mm -hmm. that, the crop load down low enough so that those grapes that are remaining ripen. And uh, if you're interested in high volume production, this ain't, this ain't the place. Right. There are areas of Washington, I think, that are pretty good and have shown themselves to be pretty good in the past. But anyhow, that's uh, my introductory bab babble. I see if I have anything else in my little notes here. Uh, <laughs> it's, I will say that it helps to have a broad experience in this business. I, you know, I've then I've done lots of crazy things, remodeling homes. Uh, uh, trying to think of some other crazy stuff. Um, uh, construction and you know, day labor, all those sorts of things. Have, and all, I can't think of anything that I've done that hasn't contributed in some positive way to the, uh, to the business. And uh, uh, I've had the good fortune to see how grapes are grown in other parts of the world. I was invited at one point to be to, uh, well, we made a wine back in an 83 Pinot Noir that won an international reward award. And my reward was to send me over there to, to visit a number of those wines. I don't know, I may have said that already. Uh, a number of those uh, of vineyards over there, talk to their, their growers. And that was, uh, it was an honor. And also to be a participant in, a, in an international tasting. Uh, 
Now, are you referring to the burgundy tasting, or is this a separate tasting? This is probably the burgundy thing, yeah. The one that is. you're kind of famous for. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, I heard that you made three of the f top five. Is that right? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's the case or not over there. I, that, I, it's conceivable, but I don't know what they would be. I know I made a Pinot Noir that was, was, it was, uh, some of the French winemakers were downright jealous. Yeah. Because you can't make burgundies in this part of the world. We didn't call it burgundy anyhow, mm -hmm. but it was compared and it was submitted in burgundy tastings. And uh, there, was, there was a little animosity there. It went away pretty fast. And we were, you know, we were all in the same business, all right. making the same mistakes. They've just been at it longer. And, but it was, that was a remarkable experience. You know, it was, we were well-treated, well-fed, as you can imagine. And uh, uh, participated in a nice kind of familial relationship, which I, I respect. Right. So you were very much welcomed over there. It yeah, wasn't... yeah. No, I wasn't. I didn't find any enemies. There, uh, we're all in the same lousy boat together. You know, we, we, they've made mistakes longer than we have. You know, they, right. they've, they've learned through generations of experience, and we're just into our second generation here, mm -hmm. I guess about, and uh, we still have a lot to learn. Uh, and we have to listen to the to this the, the environment. We have to respond to the setting. We don't don't go to a book and say this is the way we have to make it, mm -hmm. because that won't work. And I, I'm sure there are a number of people in this business who could who could uh, verify that statement, uh, yeah. where they've planted the wrong varieties and in the wrong areas or they've, they've overcropped and tried to get more production out of the, And, it, you know, they stop and think about it, you know, it's economically painful to cut what could be five tons of the acre back to three or two, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the, the setting and the variety. Uh, I will say in general about the Oregon industry, or particularly in this part of the country, is that uh, hindsight has been an exceptional tool, and I said that before, but the, the fact that we have had to, we compare climates, and the varieties are planted in different climates, but there have been lots and lots of experiments with, with all kinds of crazy varieties, and some have been miserable failures, and some have been successes, and I think that's part of the evolution of any kind of crop growing activity anyhow, is that you you look around you and you, you uh, assess what's, what, what your surroundings are and, and uh, count the deer <laughs> because they do like grapes. Mm -hmm. uh, they like everything in this yard too, as a matter of fact. We have them sleeping in here in the morning. Uh, but the, it takes I think I mentioned courage or foolhardiness to, to plant grapes in a new area. <clears throat> and uh, I, I, I think that there are many of the original growers who uh, have to be praised for their, for their courage or foolishness, either whichever I've said in the past. But, uh, Perhaps a bit of both. Oh, always, yeah. It's an adventure and, uh, you know, it's... Agriculture in general is a risk. Uh, jump in and and see if there's water in the pool. You know, it's mm -hmm. that's that's the way it works. And we've had, as you as you probably know, this this northwestern part of the of the country has been the victim of lots of experimentation in agriculture, and to some extent, some failures and some successes. Whether it's grapes or bananas. I don't know anybody's planting bananas, but uh, the uh, and it's curiously populated by a lot of people who weren't essentially natives in the first place, and mm -hmm. uh, 
So I guess I've had a ba enough babble. Any more questions? I do have more questions. Of course you do. You had mentioned David Lett. Yeah. And by the time this project got started, of course, we had... David was gone. Him. Yeah. Yes. Would you mind telling us about him and what he was like? Cantankerous, uh, opinionated, a loving man. He really a great, great, decent human being. He, he and I were very good friends. And uh, he... Uh, he had his own way of doing things, and they weren't all right. Uh, I, I helped bail him out a few times because he was, made some errors in, in the vineyard but, and in the winery. Mm -hmm. uh, but a true pioneer, and uh, God knows some of his wines were, were elegant, just beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, it was a, almost a love-hate relationship. We, we did... We did enjoy each other's company, and we differed a lot, but uh, we, we kind of nurtured each other in our, and he did a lot of hard work in trying to find the right habitat for his grapes. He was all over the place looking and getting climatic measurements and all sorts of things before he settled on that piece of property where they're, I don't know, does the family still, still own that vineyard up there? I, I think they, they do. do. I think I ran into Diana. Uh, a while back, and what was the youngest, Jim? There's Jim and Jason. Yeah, I think it's Jim. I heard that Jim, and they're uh, still st still stumbling along there. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been some plantings up in that region that were way off base and have failed. There have been, you know, the who was the French group that uh, planted that planted up Dumbling there? Drew in. Drew in. Yeah, are they still up there? Yes, they are. Is, uh, is uh, what's her name? Uh, Veronique. Veronique, is she still there? Yeah, she comes at least twice a year. Yeah, after. yeah, she was, a, she was a good friend. And uh, she had to convince some of her professional French colleagues that she knew what she was doing. And they couldn't apply all the same sorts of techniques that they did in Burgundy to what we are doing over here. Right. So that, that took a lot of courage, a lot of strength on her part. Yeah, what was that like, do you know? Um, because of course Robert Drouin was the first Frenchman to invest in mm -hmm. Oregon. Mm -hmm. What was that like witnessing that from the Oregon side? Well, I think there were mixed feelings. A lot of people say, well, this, this, is, this justifies our existence. I mean, you know, there were a bunch of francophiles in this business. Uh, and uh, others were saying, well, the French are going to come in and take over. And I guess justification wasn't necessary, first of all. And secondly, they didn't take over. Right. They, uh, some of them were too doggone snooty to think that they could ever do anything over here anyhow. I think I mentioned that before. Uh, but Barry Inc. Was, uh, she, was a, she was a good neighbor. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'm, and she had she had a fight. She had to argue with her her, her familial connections a lot to mm -hmm. get what she had. The winery was uh, very elaborate and very expensive. I don't know. Is it still up there? Yes, it's still beautiful. Yeah, it's still it was, big. It was terribly expensive and very large, and and. Uh, they, were, they cut their crop load way, way down, as I recollect, so it had to take a lot of acreage to, mm. to keep, that, keep the winery going. Mm -hmm. And what was the other one that I had something to do with? And I can't remember the name. It was a mess. Again, another fellow who had read too many books and not, hadn't, hadn't got his feet dirty mm -hmm. that uh, built a... Oh, everything's going to be gravity from top down. So we had a huge hole in the ground by the time he got through where the stuff I, the finished wine came out and went to the bottle. But then the next question was, how do you get it up out of there and into the market? Oh, there are kinds right. of, I, I wish I could remember the name of that winery. It's, it may still be there, but it was a, an architectural and logistical brouhaha. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's, a, that's also part of the industry, isn't it? Part of any new growing industry, lots of people trying to make it work. Mm -hmm. And lots of people failing. The worst thing you can do, I think, 
in agriculture and come, is to, to walk in with a great big pocket full of preconceptions of what this habitat can give you. Mm -hmm. You really have to ask it. You don't tell it. And uh, I think that's an important dis it's a distinction. Uh, so when you listen were, to the land. Yes. Sorry to interrupt Put you. Put your ear to the ground, whatever. When you were making wine, obviously Pinot Noir was huge here. What was some of your most rewarding vintages or varietals to work with? Well, we, Blasters planted a lot, and they also contracted for a lot of grapes from different settings and, and varieties. And uh, as the more we worked, the more we realized which varieties were going to work and which weren't. And we had Riesling that, we made some Rieslings that were acceptable, but they weren't, they weren't stunning. Mm -hmm. uh, Chardonnays, same thing, although Char uh, Chardonnays were decent. I, I don't think we made any bad wines. At least we, if we did, we didn't acknowledge it. They uh, went somewhere else. Uh, uh, I think some of the dangerous things that people did when they entered the business here was try to model it after another region in, the, in you know, whether it's the Alsace or whether it's uh, uh, Burgundy or whatever. And, and they did that with planting and they did it with winemaking techniques. And so we had to evolve out of that, uh, pre, uh, all of those preconceptions and say, well, what is this soil telling us to do? Mm -hmm. What is this rainfall telling us to do? And if we want models, we better find models that are very, very similar to what we have. And in some cases that turned out to be Burgundy. Uh, there were lots of, I think of, uh, oh shoot. Some of the, uh, well, unnamed er uh, errors that some people made, planting huge varieties of the wrong clone of something. Mm -hmm. after, after everybody else was saying, no, you can't do this. Or one of the big brouhaha's he was getting, I think, did I mention this? Got a phone call from one of my colleagues that said, can you crush some grapes or press some grapes for me? He bought a big press and, and uh, didn't have the power to plug it in. <laughs> uh, and he was really a, a more, a better respected winemaker in the state, but he made so many jumbled up brouhaha's. You, it's, but I guess that's part of any new business. If people, but to, to Forget that you have, you need power to run a press. That's that's taken a little too far. Uh, I was just thinking of that that area west of here. They did the same kind of thing. They they. Uh, Planted all the wrong varieties and then got the wrong kind of equipment. Didn't know how, didn't even have a pump to get their grapes into a crusher or mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Or, and uh, they had to practically rebuild the whole winery. And that's just, just the other side of town. Right. Past, just past the sewage disposal plant. When you hear stories like that and you know that the people who first started here, it was so much an experiment. Do you still find it surprising looking back how well the Oregon wine industry has done? Well, I think that's a tribute, a tribute to the environment and to the slow realization of what will work and what won't. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a matter of time and experience and a lot of hindsight. Mm -hmm. uh, any kind of agricultural venture, I think I've said this so many times, that if you enter with a huge preconception of what it should be uh, without understanding what that setting can give you, you've, you've made mistakes. You know, that, that has to do with vine interval, variety, elevation, all kinds of, of physical attributes of, and, and climatic attributes of the, of the area. Mm -hmm. And I could point to some vineyards that 
basically planted three times the variety of the, the vines they should have and had to go in and thin them to get, to get any production at all. And uh, I guess, I guess that's, that's human nature too, isn't it? Oh, sounds like a great business to be in. Think of that. The wine business. Oh, wonderful. How romantic. Mm -hmm. And as, as the, some of my early, well, it was Bud Berg who ran Franciscan years ago who, who said, you hang the romance up at the door. You know, it's, uh, it's hard work and it's cold and it's wet and it's dirty and it's mm -hmm. to some degree accidental. Uh, right. So, in your experience in the wine industry, having seen and done so much, what are some of your lessons learned? Or if you had to do something over again, what would that be? Oh, I'm trying to think. I mean, it's an evolutionary, it's a series of mistakes, yes, but can you always remember what, what mistakes you've made? Me, I, I might have written one or two down here, maybe. No, uh-uh. Well, if you I was told one, at one point I had too much education. Really? For this job, yeah. That was, uh, who was that? That was somebody. Oh, that was one of the Mandavis. Too much education. Mm -hmm. Why would that be a detractor? I, could, I couldn't <laughs> answer the question. Maybe you're scared. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe they thought I would wouldn't stay, mm. or whatever. I, I have no idea. Yeah. The Napa Valley was a funny place to be when I was there. It was, they, they were absolutely convinced there's no place else in the world where you could grow grapes as well as they could. And uh, that ego really, really, really was dominant, uh, particularly in some of the high-end wineries uh, that they we, 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 this is better than any, than any French winery possibly could be, you know. Well, that's just not, you know. Wine is an interesting thing. It does, the grapes respond to the climate and you, you respond to the grapes. And that's, you can't change the climate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so if, if you planted the wrong grapes in the wrong variety, you have to convince yourself that, uh, all you have to do is modify your techniques to make it work. And that doesn't always work either. Some of the, the Napa Valleys was at one time, time full of varieties that really shouldn't have been planted there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they learned again through retrospection. Uh, hindsight is a wonderful tool when it comes to agriculture. Uh, what would work? And most wineries in the upper northern region of the, of the Napa Valley have responded very nicely over the years to the appropriate varieties mm -hmm. and done a very good job of making one or two or three varieties. Uh, the, uh, there were, the perception when I was there was there was nothing you could, could that you would make bad wine and there was a lot of bad wine. But as our public got more and more perceptive and, uh, and then the, the industries had, had to grow up to, to respond to the public interest. And, and, and of course in the Napa Valley, as they got, a, they got plenty of attention for some of the good, the good varieties that they produced, mm -hmm. they were smart enough to enhance the production of those varieties. And we did the same thing here, I think, pretty much. We had a little bit of retrospection into the in West Coast winemaking, and uh, that helped some. And then we found what would work and what wouldn't. And we didn't come up here, I don't think anybody came to this part of the country with the kinds of perceptions of what the varieties were that they had in California.
Mm-hmm. Uh, we had some people who were very successful in California that came up here and failed. Uh, I won't name names, but uh, it happened <clears throat> simply because their egos wouldn't let them respond to the environment. So, how have you seen the Oregon wine industry evolve since you got into it? And if you're comfortable, I'm also curious about the Napa side. How has that evolved? <clears throat> well, I can't say a whole lot about the Napa side since I'm not there anymore. But uh, we we did we did see in in Napa the perception that you could anything you put in the ground could make great wine, get modified historically so that the kinds of the, I don't I don't think you'll find the great variety of different kinds of wines coming out of the Napa Valley that you did 20 years ago mm -hmm. and that's that's a that's that's maturation that's a growing up a little bit mm -hmm. and uh, uh, comparing ourselves all the time to other parts of the world I think is a it, I don't think it's quite that common in in Napa uh, as it used to be, mm -hmm. we're not the uh, the uh, mirror image of any kind of uh, any French producer. So there might be some that still carry that around. Uh, so there's a kind of maturation that has occurred, I think, in good sense uh, in California and here too, for that matter. Uh, because I do know, uh, I could name some names of people who came up with the same idea that while well, this is the Mecca, we can put anything in the ground and it'll grow and give us good wine. And it hasn't. And then there is another, there was another school that said, oh, well, it doesn't matter how good the grapes are. If you pound on them with the right mallet, why well, you can get something drinkable out of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, I think we're, we've kind of passed, surpassed that uh, view too. Uh, I could name probably one or two in, in Oregon that are still doing that kind of thing. Uh, uh, in spite of the, of the habitat, they're trying to make good wine, but uh, they're not making a very high-end product. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, maybe, maybe they're making something that can be a good everyday wine. Who knows? Maybe that'll happen. Uh, a lot of... of Wine writers of, of quality have said that what we we need to do is make a good everyday wine, and I don't know if we can do that here. We can if everyday budget is is higher than the average, but right. uh, for the most part, I, I I don't know that we can do high volume, high quality grape and wine production. Maybe, maybe in the eastern part of the state, maybe in the southwest Washington. Uh, there have been some experiments up there, but they they got carried away too. Mm -hmm. uh, the most, I guess, the most important single element in 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 planting a vineyard is to get some idea of what the soils and climate and uh, have have been over the previous 50 years. And before you go go crazy and plant varieties that you just simply because you like them, right. uh, which is, as I've indicated, been done, uh, not always going to work. It's an accident. And, you know, we've had a lot of accidents in this state, and the, 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 ult, the ultimate result is that we've tossed we haven't tossed the baby out with the bathwater. We we've we have uh, held on to those that worked and got rid of those that didn't. And I'm sure there's no other winemaker in the state that couldn't tell you the same thing. In your opinion, what are some of the best varietals to grow out here? Uh, well, Pinot certainly has to lead the pack. And in the right setting, Chardonnays, all they seem to take, they take a little bit more warmth than we have here. There certainly have been some nice Chardonnays made in the state. Riesling, 
I was always my baby. I thought that Riesling was a natural, but it, 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 for some reason or another, it's not a real popular variety. I think mostly because people make it too sweet. Mm. And it, it makes a really good uh, uh, downright powerful wine if it's not too sweet. If it's all goo, I, I don't like it. That's me. Uh, but uh, a, just enough sweetness to counterbalance the, the inevitable high acidity you get with Riesling uh, can make a very nice wine. What else? We played with Muna Turgau, nothing. No, it doesn't have any, no substance. Not in this area, anyhow. And for most places, it's, it's, it's used as kind of a, used to bulk up other wines, you know. What else? Have you talked to my son-in-law yet, with Rich? I did talk with Rich. Oh, he'll give you some thoughts, too. I'm sure they're a little yeah, different from mine. I think Riesling was one of his babies, too. I just always loved Riesling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Speaking of Rich, how did you meet Rich? And, of course, he's married to your daughter. Well, that's it. <laughs> how did he meet your daughter, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Let's see. I don't know which came first in this case. Well, let's see. Rich came to work for me it's at, at, at uh, Sokol Blosser. And he came with a, lo a load of crazy ideas about wine, which he still has, but it's, he's made it work. Uh, uh, wait a minute. I, I just about remember how he met Robin. I think it was a tasting in eastern Washington. Not eastern Washington, western Washington. You know, uh, over there where the Columbia makes a turn. Mm -hmm. uh, that might have been it. And he gave her a ride home or something like that. Ooh. That was, and that was it? I wish I'd flatted his tires. <laughs> uh, I think that's how they met. Okay. Yeah. And uh, did your children get into the wine industry, or I have a son in, who's making wine in North Carolina. Oh wow! And he's probably the most successful winemaker in North Carolina because he plants the right varieties in the ground. Uh, there's a North Carolina has made a mess out of wine, and mm -hmm. in, in many cases because people came in with preconceived ideas of why they're going to, how they're, I'm going to make a great something or another here. And that they haven't bothered to look around and see if it grows there. Right. Uh, and so there, I can't say that there are a lot of good, uh, high quality wineries in the state. Uh, uh, my son worked for one, and this guy didn't care what it was as long as it, as he had, as you, it sold, and uh, he kept the price down, the quality down, and mm -hmm. and uh, he had a big mouth and a lot of po a lot of political uh, influence, and that ha he hasn't helped the industry that much. There are, and I don't know why, but North Carolina is kind of an enchanting place, especially the Piedmont. It's really beautiful up there, and uh, I think a lot of people were just enchanted with the idea that they could move out of the city and go up into those beautiful hills and make uh, world-class wine. And uh, they're not, very, like I said, not very many varieties that grow very well in that part of the world. Uh, my son has, a, has a, a, a couple of, he has some very good sites and he uses, uses uh, somewhat dramatic techniques to make really good wine, but he, he does it and it sells. Uh, other parts of the country? Was, it, was, that, was that one of your questions? I think that's where we're going, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's the, the Finger Lakes area of New York. Yeah, well, they've been making good wine for a long time. Uh, they're making the varieties, a lot of them are hybrids mm -hmm. over there. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I was just thinking, uh, there's been, there was some interest in some of the, in the, in the New England states are making high-end varietals like Chardonnay and Pinot, and uh, 
I don't know how well they've done. Uh, they, uh, they've been moderately good, but not, not, you know, it's all, it's really all about habitat. And uh, we, you can't do much to force force uh, uh, an, an incorrect habitat into being a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, if you're an area that can give you high yields of, of modest quality wines, God knows there's a market for those. Just go to any supermarket. And there they are, half gallon jugs or whatever. And some of them are decent, you know. Mm -hmm. We buy some relatively expensive uh, wines. Uh, Although we, my wife's got kind of hooked on, on uh, Oregon wines. Uh, funny how that happens. <laughs> uh, but there are there are there's they're decent everyday wines. I just don't know how what areas there are in this state where you can make inexpensive everyday wines, mm -hmm. and uh, so we have to. So, narrow down on what we produce and clearly if you get low yields and, uh, and the production time is long, prices have to go up. Uh, and if the prices don't meet this customer satisfaction, they can look for something else. And that's what a lot of my, you know, my son-in-law sells a lot of wine really cheap. And uh, uh, Because he 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 can call on some high yield vineyards to make decent wines mm -hmm. rather inexpensively. Well, what else? What's next? I what, think what I want to show you the folder that I brought. We found some great news clippings of the Burgundy Challenge and right around that era. Oh, where is the promised land? <laughs> we oh, you'd have a, interesting a looking cover. <laughs> There's Willie. Yeah, he finally got, I think he just got fed up with the business. Who was that? Bill, Bill Blosser. Bill Blosser. And so Susan kind of took over. Yeah. Erath, I ran, when, I've run into him a couple of times since we've come back. He shows up. <laughs> mm. yeah. No more bad, no words about bad pennies. There's Wurtz, huh? Okay. Well, that's fun. So from what you recall, how did the Burgundy Challenge come about? I wish I could remember. I think Stephen Carey had a hand My, in it. Steve Carey may very well have set it up. Mm -hmm. And they were all tasted blind, and we came out on top. <laughs> Which was a bit of an embarrassment. There were, there was rumors that some of the judges wanted to change their vote. Really? Mm -hmm. After the after, fact. After 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 it popped up. Uh huh. And but we did a kind of reciprocal uh, visit, though. I, I got to visit over there, and a bunch of them came over here, and they went home with a better feeling about Oregon wines and the people that were making them than they had. You know, I have to say. You know, Burgundy's been pretty snotty over the years, or was. I don't know if they're that much anymore, but they were all tied up in in ego, and you know, they're just simply there's no place on this world, on this planet, other than Burgundy, where you can grow really good Pinot Noir, uh, and that has proven itself not to be true. Um, what is your winemaking philosophy? Oh, I don't. Jeez. Make the best wine you can, given the, the highest quality product you can start out with. Don't mess it up. You know, I think that's, uh, I think that's anybody who's pragmatic enough to acknowledge it was, would say well, that's their philosophy. I don't believe that you can pound a variety into something you insist that it be. You have to, re right. you respond to the grape. And that's, uh, so basically, the best, I think I mentioned this before, but the best wine making is, uh, is a response to the, the vineyard, mm -hmm. not to the, the uh, 
iron fist of the line maker. It's, uh, and if you have poor grapes, you make a, a second class wine and sell it cheap. And if you like, you might have a, you might use a different name. Uh, so, so it doesn't, it doesn't associate uh, you with the high-end wines that you profess to make. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's just business. That's a reasonable. And dealing with natural products, you know, you don't always get what you want. And if you don't, well, you make a really nice red table wine, for example. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, you can push it around any way you like and make a decent red table wine, but don't call it Pinot. That's a, if, if we are, have, we have, I guess, become a, a part of the world that's pretty well known for its Pinot Noir, you don't uh, corrupt it uh, with uh, low quality grapes. Mm -hmm. And that's something a lot of, a lot of winemakers and, and growers have had to learn the hard way in this part of the country. You know, you just don't, and I, 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 mean, I won't name any, but there have been two or three uh, pretty good people in this business that simply never, never realized that. that you just, that, that Salzier thing is right. You don't make a silk purse from a Salzier, and you don't, and you don't sell second quality, second rate wines as high quality Pinot. Mm -hmm. And we made some of those. We, we made dry red. We made dry red table, table wines from varieties that weren't weren't up to uh, our own personal standards. And I, it is an, an aesthetic is a, is an important. I've said this repeatedly, but it's an important element of this business. Mm -hmm. If you. Uh, there's plenty of market for good, everyday, ordinary wines. And in some areas in Oregon, you can probably make them. But the, the biggest problem we have is restriction of, of crop yield. You know, we don't, we don't get high yields, and then the economics get in the way of making cheap table wines. Was becoming a winemaker sort of a natural progression for you? It's a series of accidents. It, was it, when it happened though, was it kind of like, geez, how did I get here? I'm a little nervous. Or were you like, yeah, this, <clears throat> I've got this. Well, the lab job was easy, you know. Uh, and as my experience in the laboratory that was at, at Franciscan, uh, as I watched the process, as I assessed the quality of the grapes, I, mean, I did all the basic measurements on the grapes before they went to the crusher, for example. Mm -hmm. And as I tasted the juice and these sorts of things, well, it just kind of evolves. It just, you recognize that you are able, initially probably through measurement, and then later on just through the sensory evaluation, you you can uh, you can basically get a handle on what quality is. It's nothing you can't define it with numbers either. What is a high quality wine? Oh, oh, that's got a fourteen in the you know, out of fifteen. That that's 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 marketing, but that's not that's not quality assessment. And it is it's, it's too it's it's too uh, what's the word I want? Much of an aesthetic. And is not always measurable. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you, with time, I guess you develop some kind of sense for what is good. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I I can almost remember, almost recollect that evolution in myself. Just as say. The longer I worked in the lab and the more I tasted wines that were coming into a large winery and all kinds of quality and different different character that I was getting more and more able to say what was going to make a good wine mm -hmm. without the lab, you know. 
I don't put down the lab, but I certainly would assess the sensory elements of, of quality assessment being at least half, at least 50% of the, your, your quality uh, assessment, maybe more. There are lots and lots of winemakers that don't, don't pay any attention at all to lab work. And some of them have, have had dismal disasters because of it too, sometimes. Right. Uh, we've had various episodes of diseases of, of grapes that have resulted in very poor quality wines. And if you can't discover these before the stuff hits the crusher, you better go pump gas. You know, I've right. done that too, by the way. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> Were you a, a winemaker until you retired, or did you go into something else after that? Well, I'm just trying to think. It's been part of me for so long. Nope, it's gone. If it comes back later, I'll let you know. Okay. Yeah. Well, that was all of the questions that I had. Was there something that I should have asked you or that you want on the record before we end? <laughs> well, let's see. I don't think so. I can't think of anything. I guess home remodeling doesn't have a whole lot to do with winery, but it was construction experience and did help when we, we built the, the winery in, in Sokol Blosser. Uh, I think what's the word I want? Diplomacy has a part, particularly in the dealings between growers and winemakers. Uh, the best winemakers probably grow their own grapes because they have a sense of what's needed. Some of the worst deals are from people who grow grapes purely for profit. Uh, and they may have some physical measurements that they like to make. Is that, that's Louis. Hi, Louis. It's all right. <laughs> Cats are funny. They're really very perceptive creatures. Uh, this, this cat can't stand my son-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> He's just racking up the points against him. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Louie. Uh, he actually thinks of himself as the guardian of this property, too, I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We named him, I think I mentioned this earlier, after the explorer, Lewis, because he's always sniffing around. And he, and he does his rounds. He, he'll, he'll patrol the perimeter. And, uh, I don't know what he does if he sees anything, but he, he maybe he runs but and he's hides. Patrolling. But yeah. he's patrolling. Uh, where was I? I think you were telling us about bad winemakers. Oh. <clears throat> Because the good winemakers are probably the ones that are growing their own grapes. Yeah, I think bad wine winemakers are those who are buying their grapes purely on price. Mm. And so they're looking for, they're going for high yield vineyards that can produce grapes at low cost and maybe not, not a, a level of maturity that's, uh, that's um, essential for grape for good wine. And evaluating maturity is another thing that's very difficult. I built that from a pile of junk we got at a garage sale. It's gorgeous. Isn't wow. it beautiful? <laughs> yeah, it came, it came to us in pieces from on two or three truckloads of junk. Wow. But the one thing that came with it was the original manual for that particular model, so I, I rebuilt it. And it's, it's, that's... Uh, that's a, fr that's a friend, you know. Uh, 
So the worst thing, and worst thing you can do is is buy on price. I mean, is go shopping for the the lowest price you can get, and I, and and the grower that can give you the lowest price is usually by are usually growing grapes of getting too high a yield in his vineyard. Mm -hmm. So in this area, that's terribly important. If you have, if you have a, a too heavy a load, you just get a, a acid sugar imbalance that you just can't do anything about. Okay, so a lot of a lot of winemakers who are buying this way will buy grapes that are too high in acid and too low in sugar. So they will they will knock down the acid and bump the sugar, but it doesn't give you the it doesn't give you that mouth feel mm. that uh, a mature grape mature juice will give you. And and if if you're buying cheap Cheap Oregon wines, you're probably buying wines that have been handled this way. Or purchased from some other area where they can get high sugars without quite the management aspects that you need. And this, you know, crop thinning is a very important issue in this part of the world. Very often, or almost always, the crop is going to be like any biological entity that is trying to produce offspring here. Uh, and we very often get crop loads early on that are too high. So you go in and early, early in the in the history of that year's uh, vintage, you may go in and drop a lot of fruit to the ground. Mm -hmm. And I think you've probably already talked to growers who do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you happen to be in just the right place, where the habitat won't allow the vineyard to produce, then uh, you, that's a blessing. And I think to some degree that happened up uh, uh, <clears throat> on that hillside where SB and, and uh, Irie are parked. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not going to make any comments about the, the winery as it currently exists. Fair enough. <laughs> Jordan, Camille, do you have any questions? Mark, any thought? questions? I babbled so long, I lost you interest. You answered everything. <laughs> Rich, any questions? I do have one question for you, and it's totally random. Here, come Totally random, but um, do you ever ride a motorcycle out to your vineyard? I might have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we saw pictures of you, and it just... Didn't look like a typical winemaker from the time. We were just curious if that was, uh, if that yeah. was just something we noticed. Yeah, or? no, I've, I've had motorcycles. Uh -huh. and we very yeah. much had this, you know, Navy man tattoos on the biceps. Yes. <laughs> yeah. A bit of uh, a winemaking badass. Uh, my, uh, my son has an absolutely gorgeous motorcycle. He, he makes wine in North Carolina, mm -hmm. and his goal is to ride it out here. And uh -huh. he'll probably do that one of these days. It's a monster machine. I just, it's uh, scary. And I had a Vincent for a while. I don't know if you know motorcycles or all the Vincent Black Shadow, which it, it, at, uh, at the time I was riding it, that motorcycle had the land speed record. For <laughs> and you, you can't ride a motorcycle like that without opening it up once in a while. Of course. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I guess I think, I think maybe, Maybe they kind of go hand in hand, the adventuresome spirit or whatever you want to call it, or idiocy, maybe, maybe as, as you, I think I've said that before, one or the other or both. But yeah, I've, I've ridden motorcycles. And uh, yeah, Sean is talking about riding his beautiful big machine out here someday. I think at one point he had a sidecar on that thing too, which is, <laughs> that's a kick. <laughs> All right, Bob. Well, thank you so much. I My think pleasure. This concludes the formal portion of the interview. Okay.